Before we begin, I'd like to give a brief mention to my friends at Historical Realm on Facebook, a group I enjoy for sharing and learning about all kinds of historical topics, and graciously let me share my videos and posts with them. Check them out! In this video, we will give a brief overview of the armor and weapons used by Mongol warriors in the early 13th century. While tactics, discipline, logistics, command, and strategy are more important in terms of studying military history, weapons and armors are useful for their relation to tactics and cultural factors. Plus, they have the addition of being very easy to make a video out of. This is not meant to be an exhaustive discussion of the topic, but provide an idea of the variety of equipment the Mongols utilized as opposed to the popular image of them as fur-clad barbarians wielding clubs and fists. First, every Mongol wore their traditional robes, the del, or kelig. These robes could be repurposed at need to serve as tents, blankets, and with their wide sashes and tight belts, provided storage for knives or other materials. Many of the horse archers wore little but their del, using the range of their bows and mobility of their horses to keep them safe from their foe. For armor, Mongols generally wore combinations of lamellar, scale, laminar, brigandine, leather, and mail, with lamellar being the most common in contemporary artworks. Lamellar armor is made up of metal pieces laced to each other, providing a flexible yet durable suit of armor. Lamellar should not be confused with the similar sounding laminar or banded armor, which is made up of hardened leather and horizontal strips or bands, effective armor and cheaper than lamellar. Scale armor is also similar to lamellar, except that its armor pieces, be they leather or iron, were attached to a leather backing rather than to each other as in lamellar. Lamellar and laminar were used to armor horses, although how common this was is debated. For the rider, rather than armor each leg individually, the bottom half of the armor came down into skirts which, when sitting on horse, covered the legs to the boots, which could themselves be armored. To protect the shoulders and arms, large pauldrons covered the upper arm to the elbow. Fine protection, but if the arms were lifted, could leave the armpits vulnerable. One possible means of armpit protection was known as the four mirrors. Four metal discs attached to the back, chest, and armpits to provide extra security to these vital spots. Contemporary artwork tends to only show a chest or a back disc in place, however. Hands, as in many Asian armors, were often left unarmored to not impede use of bows. The head was protected with an acorn-shaped helmet, made of iron or iron framed with bronze, and a neck with lamellar flaps or leather, which could be wrapped in front of the face for warmth or to keep out dust. Male covers and masks were worn by peoples the Mongols interacted with and brought into their armies, so it is possible such were worn by the Mongols. It is sometimes stereotyped that mail was a western armor and lamellar an eastern, but mail was long known in China and Mongolia. Yet mail was less commonly worn by the Mongols and Chinese. For the Mongols, the suggestions being that lamellar provided better protection against arrows, or was easier to produce and maintain than mail, particularly in nomadic societies with limited access to blacksmiths. Mail could be worn in conjunction with lamellar, protecting areas like the armpits otherwise left exposed. Leather armors, aside from laminar, were also used, boiled and molded to shape into a cuirass. A notable armor was the Hatanga Del, reinforced versions of the Mongol Del, similar to later European brigandine. Indeed, it has been suggested by Mikhail Gorik that European brigandine was inspired by the Hatanga Del, but the connection here seems tenuous. In the 12th and early 13th century, the Hatanga Del was reinforced with layers of felt. Over the course of the 13th century, it became more commonly reinforced with iron plates the rivets attaching them sticking out to the front of the armor, creating this distinctive, studded appearance. Mongol warriors were not uniformly armored or armed, and it is debated to what extent, if at all, the Khan provided his warriors with their equipment. It seems under the reigns of Urgadai and Munk that forms of regular provision were established, but under Chinggis Khan, many warriors likely supplied themselves through scavenging. 
and few at this point carried expensive swords or full suits of armor. But in one regard was each warrior well armed, and that was in the famed Mongol bow. While we'll cover the bow in more detail on its own, I'll give an overview here. The medieval Mongolian war bow is what we term a composite reflex bow, made from layers of horn, wood, and sinew, which allow it to handle the great pressures placed on the bow from the reflex design. The draw weight of these bows was considerable, around 100 pounds, with extreme, but very rare, draw weights around 160. Mongols practiced archery from a young age, and drew with their thumbs, wearing a thumb ring of bone or horn which made drawing and releasing these high weights easier and cleaner. The reliance on organic glues made the bow susceptible to high humidity, the moisture destroying the glue and weakening the bow. The range of the bow is a matter of some contention. An inscription from around 1224 in Mongolia describes Chinggis Khan's nephew Yisunga firing an arrow at an extreme range of around 520 to 530 meters, so remarkable that it was marked in stone. This was likely done with a lighter flight arrow rather than a heavier war arrow. Somewhere between 300 to 200 to 150 has been suggested as the more common maximum range. Useful for dispersing enemy formations, but with penetrative power reduced. The actual effect of combat range was around 30 to 40 meters. At that range, accuracy and penetration could be assured, while allowing the Mongols to dart away from enemy archers or cavalry. Each Mongol brought two or three quivers into battle, along with around two bows, a heavier and a lighter one. Arrows were generally of willow or bamboo stalks, with heads of iron, steel, wood, or bone for different purposes, such as blunt or forked heads or special hollow heads which created a whistling sound when sent through the air, used to frighten the enemy or communicate in battle. Like the bows, there were heavy and light arrows, and contrary to some assertions it is unlikely that arrows were poisoned. While that may help in hunting down prey or fugitives, a poisoned arrow offers little tactical advantage, and is unnecessary, and can even be cumbersome to apply when the arrow shot itself is already quite effective. The Mongols preferred to stay out of close combat unless absolutely necessary, but had a number of weapons for when they had to do so. A notable example is the hooked spear, which does exactly what it sounds like. The hook was effective at dragging their enemies out of their saddles, as they did to a Korean general in 1231. Maces and axes are commonly mentioned as sidearms, deadly from horseback, and much cheaper to make than a sword. Swords, despite their common depiction, were relatively rare in, in the early 13th century Mongol army. While elite or wealthier troops may have carried them, acting as status symbols due to their expense, the average Mongol likely only carried one if he scavenged it after a battle. The typical Mongol sword is often referred to as a Turco-Mongol saber, referring to a number of varieties of sabers which spread across the Turkic and Mongolian tribes in the wake of the Mongol conquests. It has been suggested that Mongol influence led to the adoption of curved swords in the Middle East over the 14th century, as straight swords were preferred among Arabs and Persians before the Mongol invasions. But this is another hypothesis which I would need to see more evidence for in order to support. There are a further two matters which I originally intended to include in this video, but feel it will be more effective to deal with separately. Silk shirts and gunpowder. Since there is controversy and very interesting debates around both of these, particularly gunpowder, I'd prefer the time to deal with each of these in detail elsewhere. <laughs>